The Scottish Scotland bill begins the committee stage at Westminster today with the UK government confirming it will reject the SNP's call for the power to implement full fiscal autonomy. The arguments will no doubt continue. Deputy First Minister John Swinney says full fiscal autonomy is the best route to fulfil Scotland's potential. The Scottish Secretary David Mundell, for his part, claims it would cost every family in Scotland £5,000. Well, we did ask David Mundell to come on the programme, but we're told he wasn't available. John Swinney is with us now. Good morning to you. Good morning, Gary. Uh, do you dispute that £5,000 figure? What the £5,000 figure has got to be considered within is the context of the different economic and financial performance that individual countries will deliver year by year. In two of the last four years, for example, Scotland's financial position would have been stronger than the rest of the United Kingdom. So I think the whole debate about fiscal autonomy has got to be uh, considered within the context of the wider and longer term economic and financial performance of individual countries. But just to be clear then, if David Mundell's figures are right, on day one of full fiscal autonomy, that's the position that people would be in? Well, every, family, every family would have a £5,000 bill, as it were? No, because we don't know when full fiscal autonomy would be implemented. We don't know what the detail of the financial arrangements would be at that time. So, no, I reject the £5,000 figure. Could be higher, and nobody, then. And, and nobody can put a figure on that point because it will be dependent on the point at which Scotland would acquire the responsibilities uh, as a fiscally autonomous country. And, of course, what we've said is that such arrangements have to be negotiated over time, they have to be implemented over time, as we have found with the implementation of the Calman proposals, which were conceived and put forward in 2010. But the first of the income tax-related powers will not become available to the Scottish Parliament until the spring of 2016. Well, given that there is no time frame for full fiscal autonomy, even if this amendment was to pass at Westminster, which it looks like it's not going to because of uh, the UK government's position, then there is no rush for you to do this, is there? You can come back with proposals at a, at a later date. What we think is important in the conduct of the Scotland Bill is that the United Kingdom government fulfils what the Prime Minister said he would do when he was re-elected in May. He said that he would Implement the Smith Commission. Well, well if, if, uh, perhaps if I could just give you what the Prime Minister said. The Prime Minister said he would govern on the basis of respect, and that's what he told the, the First Minister and I when he came to Edinburgh a week or so later. And if the UK government is going to govern on the basis of respect, then I think it has to respect the outcome of the United Kingdom general election in Scotland, where 50% of those who decided to vote voted for a party committed to fiscal autonomy and for substantially greater powers than conceived of within the Smith Commission report. Now, the Smith Commission report took place in November. It was a response to the referendum. And it was designed by the UK parties to essentially close off the whole constitutional argument. And in May, 50% of the people in Scotland said, no, that's not enough, we need to go further. And what the Scotland Bill has got to do is it's got to address how we can strengthen the powers of the Scottish Parliament and deliver meaningful constitutional change for the people of Scotland that enables us to strengthen our economic performance and tackle inequality. But you've said yourself that there's no time frame for this. If this is so urgent, then why not table an amendment that says, as Edward Lee, the Tory MP, has done, that you, this is something you want to happen and you want to happen as soon as possible? Well, we, we've tabled an amendment to bring forward fiscal autonomy. We were accused last when? week of... When? Well, we, we were accused last week of not bringing forward an amendment to do so. We've just done it and we're now getting criticised for bringing forward an amendment to, to bring forward full fiscal autonomy. What we've set out is but, the but fact you're that saying, these But you're saying this is about getting the economic levers. This is really important for Scotland, you're saying, but you're not putting any time frame on when you actually want to implement this. But what we'll do in the course of the Scotland Scotland Bill is we will set out a whole range of different other opportunities for us to exercise economic power, whether it's about economic power over business taxation, over energy policy, or over employers' national insurance contributions, or a whole variety of other areas where we could exercise further economic responsibilities as we build up the arrangements to deliver full fiscal autonomy. Now, that's the proposition the SNP will bring forward. Well, and what the UK government should do in the course of the Scotland Bill is they should respect the outcome of the United Kingdom general election in Scotland, which was a clear and decisive demand for the pe by the people of Scotland to have greater powers beyond Smith, and particularly the powers that would allow us to strengthen our economic performance, well, give us, give some which, clarity. Were absent, which were absent from the Smith Commission. Well, give us some clarity on what exactly you would do with those powers. You talk about business taxes there. We know, of course, that during the referendum campaign, you wanted a corporation tax that would be 3% lower than the UK. That policy has since been ditched, it seems. So what would you do specifically on that issue? What we do is we would introduce uh, business tax
tax credits for research and development to support innovation within Scotland, and that would be involve a reduction in corporation tax for companies that were taking forward particular innovations that were strengthening the research and development base of Scotland. How much of a would, cut? Well, we, we would, we would d discuss and consult on all of these proposals, but it would be a proposal to encourage further support for innovation within Scotland. We would also bring forward uh, measures to reduce the cost of employment by reducing the cost of national insurance for individual companies involved in research and development activities. So Again, would, would taxes have to rise then elsewhere to compensate for all of these cuts that you want to bring in? Well, what you do, Gary, is you use the fiscal framework available to you to deliver reductions in business taxation, where it then boosts economic performance, gets in, boosts the amount of tax that is generated by the, uh, the activity that is generated as a consequence, and the public finances are strengthened as a result. And that's the, the experience that we have, of course, from the exercise of power under devolution, where on a number of different areas of activity, Scotland's economic performance, where we've been able to exercise limited economic decision-making on our own part, Just has strengthened the economic performance of Scotland and ensured that our economy is stronger and therefore making a more substantial contribution to public finances as a consequence. A very brief point, because I'm afraid time is against us, but it seems to be suggested today by Stuart Hosey and others that uh, if the UK government, as, is, uh, as they say they are, will reject your proposal for full fiscal autonomy at this stage, that that might be the trigger for another independence referendum. This is not the material change in circumstance that Nicola Sturgeon talked about, is it? This is just you not getting your own way at Westminster. The First Minister was very clear that there would have to be a material change in circumstances before the Scottish National Party brought forward a proposal for a further referendum. And that, Stuart uh, that, Hosey's that, that, threatening that, a fresh call for an independence uh, referendum. That, 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 that remains our position. And what we think is important in the whole conduct of the Scotland Bill is that the United Kingdom government uh, governs with respect, that they listen to the arguments that are put forward, that they listen to the mandate of the people of Scotland, and they respect the fact that uh, the electorate in this country rejected the Conservative government and they demanded further powers beyond Smith, and that's what the UK government should be open to delivering. Deputy First Minister John Swinney, thank you very much for your time this morning. The new Scotland Bill begins the committee stage in the House of Commons today. Once again, the much-talked-about plans for full fiscal autonomy are likely to be centre stage. The Scottish Secretary, David Mundell, says the UK government won't accept the SNP's amendment to the bill. Professor Adam Tompkins represented the Conservative Party on the Smith Commission and is now an advisor to the Scotland office. I think the SNP's policy on full fiscal autonomy is a, ter a terrible idea because it would mean not full fiscal autonomy but full fiscal austerity. It would create, uh, as the independent IFS have said, uh, an additional 12, uh, 10 to £12 billion black hole in Scotland's finances. Okay. Well, speaking earlier on the programme, the Finance Secretary John Swinney said that David Cameron needs to fulfil promises he made after last month's election. The Prime Minister said he would govern on the basis of respect, and that's what he told the, the First Minister and I when he came to Edinburgh a week or so later. And if the UK government is going to govern on the basis of respect, then I think it has to respect the outcome of the United Kingdom general election in Scotland, where 50% of those who decided to vote voted for a party committed to fiscal autonomy and for substantially greater powers than conceived of within the Smith Commission report. Well, to discuss this, let's speak to the Scotland editor of The Spectator, Alex Massey, and political commentator, Ian McWhorter. Good morning to you Good morning. both. Good morning. Uh, Ian McWhorter, first of all, it seems publicly there's anger among amongst the SNP at this lack of respect that John Swinney was talking about there. But do you think there'll be relief too that this uh, amendment isn't going forward? Well, I'm not sure there's going to be uh, you know, a, a great deal of uh, uh, tears at the loss of full fiscal autonomy, which I, I mean, I don't think anybody thought was ever going to happen anyway. This was one of the problems with this whole debate, which has dominated both the uh, general election and the uh, independence referendum, because, of course, then full fiscal autonomy, the same arguments are used about independence. Uh, but it was all, always artificial because there was very little prospect of it ever happening. And, of course, David Mundell has now helped the SNP out of the hole they may have dug for themselves by insisting that uh, whatever its, uh, its merits may or, not, may or may not be, it's not going to happen. 
But uh, the problem really is it's obscured what will happen, which is not fiscal autonomy, but the devolution of income tax powers, which could pose as many problems. Well, indeed, Alex Mas, I mean, there's still quite a few powers to come to the uh, to the Scottish Parliament uh, from the Calman Commission, which are just being implemented. And then we've got uh, what comes from Smith as well. But as far as full fiscal autonomy is concerned, is it now dead in the water for the time being? Well, the point, there are two different arguments that have been taking place here. One about the economics and the number crunching of full fiscal autonomy in terms of the impact on, on taxes and public spending in Scotland, you know, which uh, taxes would have to go up, public spending would have to be cut or some combination of the two if things were to remain the same. Uh, and the political argument, which is all about positioning and so on and allowing the SNP to say that uh, we are still the party standing up for Scotland. Scotland is being betrayed and let down by a Westminster establishment that, don't, that doesn't treat Scotland with the respect Scotland deserves. And of course, respect in this context means doing what the SNP want, um, which isn't necessarily how everybody else in Scotland uh, will view it. Um, but it's to, it's to position themselves as the, the party of the Scottish interest, not actually to put forward a credible programme for, for the future governance of the country. You know, you will now have the SNP talking about Smith as though it's some sort of trivial list of, of powers. Now, it's true that it could go further in certain areas. I think in some ways there are, there are good arguments for it going further in some areas. But the notion that, that Smith uh, leaves, you know, is a thoroughly inadequate set of um, powers for the Scottish Parliament, I think, is one that won't wash. But, you know, even, even if that means that eventually the SNP might have to take some unpopular decisions in government in terms of tax. But the, the point, Ian McWhorter, that John Swinney was making earlier was that when we look at the recent general election, and this was part of uh, the, uh, the, the commitment from the SNP, you know, where 50% you know, 50, 50 of people who voted 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 for parties supporting full fiscal autonomy, as he puts it. Um, he believes that this is not just about snubbing the SNP, it's, it's, it's about not giving Scotland what they voted for. Well, also, I suppose, if, you're, if you accept the argument that the Scottish Parliament should be responsible for raising uh, the majority, at least, of the money uh, it spends on various services, then ultimately, you know, full fiscal autonomy, it's, it's unanswerable. I mean, there is a strong moral case for the Scottish Parliament to be given that responsibility to, if you'd like, be given enough rope to hang itself, as the uh, Conservatives uh, would see it. Uh, but as I, as I say, it it's, was never really going to happen. So actually, this has actually helped the SNP because a policy which in the short term might have had damaging consequences uh, for Scotland's finances will not be happening. But it allows them to now move on and say, well, actually, you know, what about these other uh, uh, aspects of, uh, of uh, devolution of responsibility? What about the minimum wage? What about equalities law? What about employment law? Uh, and to also say, as, uh, as, as Alex has indicated, that this allows them once again to say, you're not giving Scotland what it's been asking for, you're not giving it uh, full fiscal autonomy, you're not giving it this further control of economic powers. So in that sense, I mean, it's a win-win, I think, for the SNP. But as the chant goes, what do we want full fiscal autonomy? When do we want it? Well, at some point in the future that is, uh, is so far unspecified, Alex Massey. Uh, we've got Edward Lee, the Tory uh, MP, saying that he will lay down an amendment saying that Scotland should get full fiscal autonomy as soon as possible. I wonder whether that's a difficulty for the SNP at Westminster in terms of whether they back that or not. Well, I mean, I wouldn't do... I mean, what, what are you suggesting, that the SNP would be transformed into some sort of yellow Tories or something if they backed Edward Lee's amendment? But, uh, but ultimately, he's putting down what they want, which is full fiscal autonomy, albeit in a, in a different time scale. Well, what, what he's putting down is what they say they want, which isn't quite the same thing necessarily. Um, I, I, I would be surprised if there was a, if there was an alliance that suddenly struck up between the right wing of the Conservative Party and the SNP at Westminster. But the point um, is the SNP tabled their own full fiscal autonomy motion. I mean, a number of people had been saying that they'd shelved the idea of FFA, they had backed off the, the notion of uh, devolving all, all tax powers to Scotland. But they rather trumped that by tabling uh, the motion calling for it. So, uh, in a sense, they're able to avoid... I mean, I don't think there's any prospect of the Edward Lee Amendment uh, succeeding anyway, because the UK government has said that it's uh, under no circumstances would it support fiscal autonomy. But it leaves the SNP's amendment there on the table and they can say well it was rejected by Westminster and uh, Ian McWhorter, Stuart Hosey the deputy leader of the SNP um, threatening to call a fresh independence referendum the Scotland bill isn't toughened I wonder what you make of that statement 
Um, well, I don't think there's any prospect of an early uh, independence referendum. I, I don't see any indication that Nicola Sturgeon is uh, eager to have one in the short term for the very good reason that the result would probably be much the same. I mean, it's very interesting that uh, despite all this uh, hoo-ha about full fiscal autonomy, support for the SNP has actually been increasing. And in the most recent opinion polls, it indicates that something like 60% of Scots would vote for SNP uh, in next year's Holyrood elections, uh, eliminating Labour from the constituency vote altogether. However, if you also look at uh, how Scots might vote if there was another independence referendum, it's rather different. Support for independence has cracked up a bit, but it's still around the 47, 48, 49 percent. I don't think there'll be another referendum until there's a very solid lead of maybe about 60 percent for yes, uh, and I don't see any, any uh, early referendum uh, from coming from Nicola Sturgeon. Yeah, John Swinney seemed to be distancing himself from, from those statements when I spoke to him a little earlier, Alex Massey, but I wonder what you make of the fact that uh, you know, this is being used as, uh, as, as leverage as it were at Westminster because uh, the SNP is not getting what it wants. Well, absolutely. I mean, that's, again, what, what, what we're talking about here is a degree of uh, political shadow boxing in some ways. Um, you know, that these amendments are not designed to, to, be, to become law. You know, they're designed to signal a message and so on. And the message is the familiar one. Only the SNP will stand up for Scotland. Only the SNP can be trusted to put the national interest first. This is the case even actually if you look at the numbers and you see that the SNP policy would actually damage the national interest in the short term, or at least that's one certain uh, interpretation you could make of the fiscal arguments. I mean, I agree with Ian. You know, I don't think that um, another referendum is an immediate possibility. I mean, there are certain circumstances you can come up with in which there could be another referendum at some point in the next parliament. But that that all demands what you know Nicola Sturgeon uh, has called this sort of material change in circumstance and so on. And I think SM, the SNP being disappointed uh, with the provisions of the new Scotland Bill, um, which as the opposition at Westminster they are duty bound to be disappointed, doesn't really fulfil the qualification or the criteria for being a material change in circumstance. Uh, but you know the danger for the SNP and and these things are of course rel relative given their current uh, preeminence in Scottish politics is that that the Scottish people will continue to vote SNP in large numbers, but that support for independence uh, will actually not increase, that there is a degree of voting SNP because that fits people's sense of who they are and the, the, the priorities that they have in terms of um, identity uh, and, a, and a certain uh, centre-left style of politics, but that when push comes to shove, actual independence is the sort of thing that they don't don't want um, and the danger for, for the SNP actually is in the longer run that greater devolution actually satisfies the demands for uh, autonomy within Scotland and so on uh, but we're also within the United Kingdom and the, the final push for independence becomes unnecessary if you like. Okay. Um, now we, we can't see you know that that may or may not happen but that's one of the calculations that we'll see in the future. Gentlemen thank you both very much indeed for your time this morning that's Alex Massey of The Spectator political commentator Ian McWhorter. It's 8.18.